This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 269, nice, of the program. Today is Friday, December 4th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the people who make this show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Aria Janke, Jimmy, Judy Cook, Kelly Scrimstad, Lajos Arvai, Lizbeth Raphael, Lyle Bardwell, Sabina Curdy, Sarah Rohr, Soulight16, and Susan Hunter. So thank Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So if everyone is feeling what I'm feeling, then we're all a little bit fatigued when it comes to politics and the election, and I think we need a break. So this is going to be a little bit of a lighter episode, some shorter segments, but nonetheless, you know, we're still going to talk politics. So this week on the program, Joe Biden has tapped Neera Tandon to direct the OMB. We'll talk about that and why it's a terrible decision. Also, there is an active effort to destroy the prospect of diplomacy between the United States and Iran. Bernie Sanders calls it out and we'll talk about his response. And also, Ajit Pai will soon be out of a job. We'll talk about what that means for net neutrality. Bill Barr contradicts Trump's claim that voter fraud existed. So we'll talk about the fallout from that. And additionally, Obama is uh, Obama-ing again and he's saying things that are just brazenly hypocritical, and I have to call it out. So we'll talk about that as well. So that's all that we've got on the agenda. We'll, we'll cover some more segments as well. But I want us to all just kind of like take a little bit of a breather and relax because we've been through a lot. Like this year has been exhausting, and it's been exhausting, you know, mentally, physically, and and politically as well. So I think that this is a good week for us to just kind of like take a breather because you know we don't have to worry about trump stealing the election too many states have certified there's not much that we can talk about with regard to biden's administration aside from his cabinet appointees and we'll discuss that but you know let's let's take a little bit of time to uh, recuperate but uh with that being said let's get right to it so it's already bad enough that Joe Biden is even considering and may still be considering Rahm Emanuel of all people for a spot in his administration. For those of you who don't remember, Rahm Emanuel, as mayor of Chicago, literally covered up the murder of Laquan McDonald. It's a slap in the face to every single Black Lives Matter activist around the country. It's a slap in the face to all of the black voters who were crucial to Joe Biden's electoral success. And apparently he is on a roll with a... Uh, returning the favor for people who helped him get elected because now he is nominating someone uh, who is uh, genuinely a shitty person. And I am not saying this just because I'm bitter because this individual near a tandem has me blocked on Twitter, but because this individual is not just the centrist. This is a right winger who is openly hawkish, who is hateful of individuals like Bernie Sanders, who Joe Biden should theoretically be embracing if he wants to unify the country. But What's really alarming to me is that Neera Tandon, like Joe Biden, has been a longtime advocate of cutting Social Security and Medicare, which uh, is a very big red flag. So as Walker Bragman of Jacobin reports, President-elect Joe Biden will reportedly nominate a White House budget director who has been one of the country's most prominent critics of U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders and who has previously backed Social Security cuts. Biden, who has repeatedly pushed for Social Security cuts throughout his career, announced his selection of Center for American Progress President Neera Tandon as his choice to run the powerful White House Office of Management and budget. A longtime aide to Hillary Clinton, Tandon touted her think tank's 2010 proposal to reduce Social Security benefits in 2012 as Biden was pushing for such cuts in the Obama administration. Tandon's Social Security push followed the 2010 midterms during the deficit reduction negotiations between the Obama administration and the new GOP Congress. Republicans drew a hard line, but Obama sought a middle ground. Central to the administration's efforts, which were led by Biden, was a plan called the Chained CPI 
CPI that would have slowed the rate at which Social Security benefits increase over time, which is a cut. Sanders led the fight in the Senate against the chained CPI, while outside groups were divided over whether to line up behind the president. Some, like the Progressive Change Campaign Committee, vocally opposed the cuts. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a liberal think tank, found that the chained CPI would cut Social Security retirement benefits by about 2% on average. The organization, nevertheless, said it would support the concept under certain conditions. Tandon Center for American Progress, at the time considered to be the largest liberal think tank in Washington, also supported the idea and was a significant voice in favor of the administration's plan. Now, you don't have to take my word for it or Walker Bragman's word for it. You can hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Nera Tandon wanted to cut Social Security. Uh, and I think that there's other, you know, there are progressive governors like O'Malley and Cuomo who've taken a much more balanced approach on, on budgets where they've looked at taxes as well as reforming programs and, and cutting programs. And so I think that's that's the approach the American people are supporting. There's a viewer here who wants you to take us deeper into entitlements mm -hmm. uh, by Twitter. Ms. Tanda, do you know what the president means when he says entitlements are on the table? Any specifics and anything you would endorse? Yeah, I mean, so there are a range of entitlements um, that, you know, I think when we're talking about entitlements, we're talking about Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. These are programs that um, that uh, people receive support because of the status that they have. So when after 65, you get funding from Social Security and Medicare. Um, actually, it's grown, it's going getting older for Social Security. But uh, and you know the president has 300 billion dollars in his budget in cuts in Medicare. Um, that comes on top of cuts in Medicare from um, the Affordable Care Act. So he has put specific cuts in the budget already in Medicare. Um, and they had savings in Medicaid in the past. Um, I think the question really is, if we're gonna have a deal to address long-term deficit reduction, we need to put both entitlements on the table as well as taxes. It's unfair to ask only middle-class Americans to bear the burden of our deficits. Middle-class Americans actually didn't create the deficits. Um, so I think the challenge is that we should have entitlements on the savings. On, on the entitlements, and uh, the Center for American Progress has, has put forward ideas and proposals to reform the beneficiary structure of Social Security. Some of our progressive allies aren't, so, aren't uh, as excited about that as we are, but we've put those ideas on the table. But we, only th we think that those are legitimate ideas that need to be put part of a proposal where everyone's at the table. We don't, let, we don't just ask middle-class Americans to sacrifice. We ask all Americans, and especially, you know, I think it's not unreasonable to ask the wealthiest Americans to pay simply what they were paying in the Bush years. Now, if you're new here and you're wondering why someone who is a progressive like Joe Biden <laughs> would nominate someone who wants to cut Social Security when Joe Biden has repeatedly stated he doesn't want to do that. Well, let me refresh your memory. Uh, this was an ad that Bernie Sanders ran during the uh, Democratic Party primaries of 2020. When I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant veterans benefits. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Well, we've got some bad news for them. We are not going to cut Social Security. We're going to expand benefits. Now, Bernie, it looks like we will, in fact, be cutting Social Security. So, you know, Biden claimed that Bernie Sanders was a liar. Liberal media, MSNBC, attacked Bernie Sanders, claiming that he lied when Bernie Sanders literally used what Biden said against him. But nonetheless, someone who has long time advocated for cuts to Social Security which has changed CPI, which is a cut over time to Social Security, to be putting someone like Neera Tandon in his administration, this tells us what Joe Biden's intentions are. He wants to cut Social Security. So in this election, we had the choice between a Democrat who wants to cut Social Security and a Republican who has repeatedly vocalized his intent to cut Social Security after the election. Great.
Now, that's just one of many reasons why Nier Tandon is a terrible choice. Additionally, she is a warmonger. She also hosted war criminal Benjamin Netanyahu at the Center for American Progress, and then silenced staffers who dared to speak out against him going there. And in a leaked email to Faz Shakir, she said this about Libya, quote, We have a giant deficit. They have a lot of oil. Which is basically the same exact thing that Donald Trump has been saying about other countries such as Iraq. And after the Union of Think Progress, which was an outlet owned by the Center for American Progress, got into a dispute with them and threatened legal action, guess what happened next? The entire outlet was shut down. This is what we'd refer to, folks, as union busting, or perhaps union nuking, because rather than trying to negotiate with the union of Think Progress, under the leadership of Neera Tandon, Cap just shut it down entirely. And in addition to terrible politics, Neera Tandon is just a shitty person, so she literally outed a staffer at Cap who came forward with charges of sexual harassment against another staffer, and she did this in front of everyone, shocking the staffers at the Center for American Progress. And in a report for the New York Times, journalist Kenneth Vogel details how she physically assaulted Faz Shakir. And he was a journalist at the time. He was an editor for Think Progress. And she punched him because he dared to ask Hillary Clinton a question that she thought was a little bit too pushy. And on top of that, she's not only against Medicare for All, a policy that would literally save thousands of lives every single year, she has repeatedly lied about it, saying that it doesn't have majority support. And she said this long after it was overwhelmingly popular. So she's a shitty person. She has terrible politics. She's basically a Republican. Um, but Biden is choosing her. And with this nomination is a declaration of war against the left. Because that's what this is. Someone who's openly antagonistic towards the left and is also functionally a Republican, that tells us that Joe Biden is not open to appeasing progressives, which isn't necessarily too surprising, but I hope that folks who had the blinders on for Joe Biden acknowledge that He's not on your side, he's not your ally, he's your enemy, and he is to be opposed. Now, part of the reason why I think that Neera Tandon hates leftists so much is because she was basically assured a spot in the White House had Hillary Clinton won back in 2016. She wanted that cushy job in the White House. And I think that she blames Bernie and the left, and for it, she's been lashing out on Twitter, like, constantly, and she's been purging her Twitter feed uh, a lot since she was uh, nominated, but all she had to do was be patient, because she's still getting that cushy job in the White House. Now, what's interesting is that you have Republicans who should take this as a victory, speaking out against Neera Tandon. Meanwhile, leftists, or I should say uh, so-called progressives in Congress, who theoretically should be against someone who is functionally a Republican being nominated to be the director of the OMB, uh, basically praising this decision. So the spokesperson for Republican Senator John Cornyn said that there's no chance that she'll be confirmed, meaning that he will be fighting this nomination. But meanwhile, Democrats who should theoretically know better, like Barbara Lee, are supporting this, saying, such a great choice to lead OMB. Neera Tandon will bring the experience and humanity, that's hilarious, urgently needed in this position. Congratulations. <laughs> Sherrod Brown tweeted out, Neera Tandon is smart, experienced, and qualified for the position of OMB director. And Elizabeth Warren quote tweeted Sherrod Brown saying, I agree, to which I responded by saying, snake emoji, snake emoji, snake emoji, snake emoji, snake emoji. So in a surprising turn of events, the left is now in a position to where we are rooting for the Republicans to win on this battle and we're rooting against leftists, or I shouldn't say leftists because I don't think Elizabeth Warren is a leftist, uh, but people who are, like, not as shitty as the other Democrats. Like, Elizabeth Warren is measurably more progressive than someone like Joe Manchin, of course. The bar is really low. But people who, in theory, should be better, who should oppose a neocon who wants to jack the natural resources from other countries, who's against policies like Medicare for All, you would think that there'd be more outrage from... Democrats who aren't as bad as other Democrats, but that's not the case. So we're in this weird predicament where we have to form this unholy alliance with Republicans and hope that they are successful at obstructing the confirmation of Neera Tandon. And it's just, it's it's a sad state of affairs. And it's stupid because Neera Tandon is basically a Republican. She is functionally a Republican. I've said that how many times now? Three times. So Republicans are kind of dumb for not taking this as a win. 
But I don't know what's more dumb. Them fighting someone who supports their deficit hawk agenda, who is pro-austerity, who wants to cut Social Security like they do, or so-called progressives like Barbara Lee and Elizabeth Warren, who is supporting someone who has fought against everything that they supposedly stood for. I mean, Barbara Lee tweets out how much we need Medicare for all, yet she's cheerleading on this shitty choice. I mean, what a joke, what a weird world that we live in. But nonetheless, I don't care who makes this happen. She has to be defeated. And if Republicans do that, great. So something really alarming and nefarious is going on. And what we're seeing is this active effort to undermine diplomacy between Iran and the United States, which is now possible because Joe Biden wants to re-enter the JCPOA, otherwise known as the Iran Nuclear Agreement, which is a peace deal. Because in this agreement, Iran agrees to not enrich uranium to a certain point, and in return, the United States will not do sanctions on them. It's basically an agreement that stops the United States from going to war with Iran. But Iran hawks, like Republicans and Israel, they don't like this agreement and they lie about this agreement because they want regime change in Iran. So what we've seen is Donald Trump behind the scenes do everything in his power to undermine a future Biden administration from re-entering this agreement. And we even learned that Trump was reportedly talked out of bombing Iran recently. But now we are learning that a top Iranian scientist was inexplicably assassinated on Friday. And what we're seeing here should be alarming to everyone, but not many politicians are paying attention. Ro Khanna has spoken up about this, and Bernie Sanders has also sounded the alarm, and I think that the alarm should be sounded because this is serious. So as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams reports, Senator Bernie Sanders warned over the weekend that the assassination of top Iranian nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, widely believed to have been the work of Israel, was carried out with the intention of undermining any prospect of diplomacy between the United States and Iran just weeks before President-elect Joe Biden is set to take office. The assassination of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh was reckless, provocative, and illegal, Sanders tweeted Saturday. As a new administration takes power, it was clearly intended to undermine U.S. Iran diplomacy. We must not allow that to happen. Diplomacy, not murder, is the best path forward. Sanders' tweet came days after Fakhrizadeh was fatally wounded Friday in what was described as an ambush as the scientist traveled by car near Tehran. While specific details surrounding the assassination continue to emerge, Iranian and U.S. officials have both said Israel, led by right-wing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, was responsible. It remains unclear what, if any, role the Trump administration played in the killing, which took place less than a week after Netanyahu, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman reportedly discussed Iran during a secret meeting that prompted fears of a coordinated attack. The Vermont senator's view that the assassination of Fakhrizadeh was aimed at forestalling the possibility of diplomacy between the United States and Iran was echoed by other lawmakers, activists, and analysts who pointed to Biden's vow to return the U.S. to the Iran nuclear accord that President Donald Trump violated in 2018. Netanyahu has published publicly urged Biden against reviving the 2015 agreement. Trita Parzi, executive president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, argued Friday that the assassination and other likely future attacks will likely harden Iran's position and complicate, if not ultimately cripple the Biden team's attempts to revive diplomacy. If Israel was behind the assassination of Fakhrizadeh, which seems highly likely, though not yet proven, it demonstrates the degree to which Netanyahu feels emboldened to undermine Democratic U.S. presidents with impunity and drag the United States into war, wrote Parsi. This will not change unless and until Washington decides to end its drive for military hegemony in the Middle East. So there's a lot to unpack here with regard to this story, but before we get to that, I want to show you this story from The Hill, which explains how the Israeli military was reportedly instructed to prepare for a Trump strike on Iran. Now, I don't know if they were actually literally instructed to prepare for a Trump strike on Iran. It could be real since he was already considering it, or it could be fake news, for lack of a better word. It could be just Israel posturing in order to scare Iran and goad them into escalating in order to basically give Trump a reason to strike if Iran believes this and acts out. I mean, the situation here is just 
it, it's really depressing, right? Because it seemed very unlikely that Iran would even be willing to come to the table. But once Biden was declared the winner of the election, well, the president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, who's more moderate, basically called on Iran to re-enter the Iran nuclear agreement, something that seemed unlikely because, I mean, think of it from Iran's perspective. Take yourself out of, you know, this American-centric perspective of foreign policy. Like, if someone withdrew on a deal that you signed with them that was really difficult to negotiate when you gave up quite a bit, wouldn't you not want to re-enter a negotiation with someone who is very obviously a bad faith negotiator? But Iran proved that they're more reasonable than us, at least in this instance, and decided, hey, let's get back into this agreement because I think that they know it's mutually beneficial. It stops the United States from invading them and they also uh, don't get the sanctions imposed on them. But by basically doing all of this, it's going to be a tougher sell for Hassan Rouhani to even come to the table because there's going to be hardliners, the Ayatollah, and individuals in Iran who aren't going to want to re-engage with the United States. So all of this, I don't know who's doing it, it's an active effort to undermine diplomacy between the United States and Iran, which is more likely with Biden as president. And it's disgusting. Well, I've got some good news for you. Uh, Donald Trump is not going to be the only individual out of a job come January 21st. Because this douchebag, Ajit Pai, current chairman of the FCC, will also be out of a job. Now, what's interesting to me is that his term doesn't actually expire until June. Nonetheless, he announced that he will be resigning a little bit early. He'll be also stepping down come January 20th. And as CNBC's Lauren Feiner reports, Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai will step down from his post on January 20th, the day President-elect Joe Biden is inaugurated, he announced Monday. The announcement means that the FCC could reach a Democratic majority sooner than it would otherwise be able to. Pai's term was slated to expire in June of 2021, though Biden will be able to choose a Democrat to chair the commission once in office. Commissioners must be confirmed by the Senate. Pai's decision to step down could have significant implications on net neutrality, an issue that helped define his term as chairman. In 2017, Pai voted with his fellow Republican commissioners to remove rules that prohibited internet providers from blocking or slowing traffic to particular sites and offering higher speed lanes at higher prices. Many major internet providers have not yet taken advantage of that rule change, however. Quote, it has been an honor of a lifetime to serve at the Federal Communications Commission, including as chairman of the FCC over the past four years, Pai said in a statement. I am grateful to President Trump for giving me the opportunity opportunity to lead the agency in 2017, to President Obama for appointing me as a commissioner in 2012, and to Senate Majority Leader McConnell and the Senate for twice confirming me. To be the first Asian American to chair the FCC has been a particular privilege, as I often say, only in America. How inspiring. Uh, the five-person commission can have no more than three commissioners from one party at any given time under the law. The president can appoint a chair of the commission from outside the agency or select one of the existing commissioners, such as Democratic commissioners Jessica Rosenworcel and Jeffrey Starks. Okay, so I've got two main things that I want to say first of all. Um, if Joe Biden chooses Jessica Rosenworcel as the new FCC chair, that is really, really good news for net neutrality proponents because she is a staunch ally to the fight for net neutrality. Second of all, uh, who wants to take bets? How long until Ajit Pai gets a cushy new job at Verizon or Comcast because he did exactly what they wanted him to do. Uh, remember that this individual served as legal counsel to Verizon and then he led the FCC. So after delivering the policy that they wanted, of course, they're going to pay him back by giving him a job probably with a really hefty sign-on bonus. I'd be surprised if I'm wrong, but trust me, he's going to be part of that industry, either a lobbyist or something, but I think that that's part of the reason why he's stepping down, because he wants to go on to make more money. He did everything that he could, except, you know, his effort to undermine net neutrality was partially obstructed by the courts, who ruled against him and said that states who enact their own net neutrality laws, well, those states can have those laws on the books, because remember, his net neutrality... Uh, repeal was so nefarious because within his repeal was a clause that blocked states from enacting their own net neutrality laws. And now uh, 
that is not standing. So states like Washington, California, Oregon, uh, who have net neutrality on the books, and New York as well, I believe, uh, they make it a lot more difficult for states to do or for internet service providers to do what they want to because states enacted their own net neutrality laws. So why would you go out of your way to you know start creating these fast lanes for some states that are less populous than other states? It's a little bit more of a hassle. I mean, maybe they'll do it. Maybe they're waiting on lawsuits. But what we know is that everything that he did can easily be undone with Jessica Rosenworcel as chairwoman of the FCC or any Democrat that Biden appoints. Because again, net neutrality was part of the Obama legacy that I'm assuming Biden will want to maintain. And he probably will take a hands-off approach to net neutrality. But so long as he puts someone in place uh, of a GPI in this position to undo what he did, that's that's a victory. So this is great news. I cannot wait to see uh, Ajit Pai gone. Good riddance. I know that you'll probably get a job at Verizon, but I don't even care. So long as you're not in the FCC uh, dictating policies when you are a shill for the industry, that's uh, that's good for me. Go Have fun at Verizon. I hope that you make a lot of money. You certainly deserve it after everything that you did, undermining the will of people who did not want you to repeal net neutrality like you did it anyway in spite of mass protests. So, um... You certainly earned that bonus that Verizon or Comcast pays you. So have fun. Have a nice life. Fuck off, asshole. Look, I genuinely don't know how it's possible that Trump still is able to, with a straight face, maintain this facade that not only the election was stolen from him, that he's the rightful winner, that he is going to become the president again. He's going to be sworn in on January 20th. And if you think that I'm joking, even individuals close to Donald Trump are still maintaining this. Not that, oh, well, he's going to maybe run in 2024. No, that he's going to be sworn in again on January 20th. Take a look at this Fox News clip with Laura Trump. Well, look, I still think that uh, the president will get four more years in office. I think it'll be the next four years because this thing is far from over. Laura, you just but had I, certifications I think... today in Arizona, in Georgia, in Wisconsin. You heard well, Geraldo moments ago look, say, you know, it's time to accept the outcome of this. What what are you seeing or hearing out there that, that he is not? Well, those certifications are just procedural steps. And the reality is the Electoral College does not vote uh, in, in their states until December 14th. Mm -hmm. uh, Congress doesn't actually certify anything until the beginning of January. So we've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> delusional, utterly delusional. And if you're saying that at this point still, you are either dumb or disingenuous. But now it's getting even harder for this facade to be maintained, for this grift to keep going, because the last loyal soldier has surrendered. That is Will Barr. And I'll admit that having that large of an image of him, like that close to me, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. But nonetheless, what shouldn't be significant actually is significant, because he is now even saying there's no evidence of voter fraud. Sorry, but uh, facts are facts. So as Jessica Corbett of Common Dreams reports, sparking immediate and widespread speculation that he will soon become just the latest top official ousted for publicly countering President Donald Trump, U.S. Attorney General William Barr on Tuesday told the Associated Press that the Justice Department has not found any evidence of voter fraud that would impact the result of the 2020 presidential election. To date, we have not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election, Barr said of the November 3rd contest in which President elect Joe Biden's decisive victory, denied Trump a second term. In the wake of his defeat, the president and his campaign have made unfounded fraud claims and filed numerous lawsuits even as states have certified their results. Barr, who had boosted Trump's baseless attacks on the security of voting by mail ahead of the election and amid a pandemic, was set to attend a previously scheduled meeting at the White House later Tuesday. The attorney general told the AP that U.S. attorneys and FBI agents have been investigating complaints related to the election which saw a record-setting early and absentee 
voting. Most claims of fraud are very particularized to a particular set of circumstances or actors or conduct. There are not systematic allegations and those have been run down. They are being run down, Barr said. Some have been broad and potentially cover a few thousand votes. They have been followed up on. Giuliani and Jenna Ellis, a Trump campaign senior legal advisor and attorney for the president, issued a joint statement Tuesday responding to Barr's remarks, doubling down on their fraud allegations and saying that with all due respect to the attorney general, there hasn't been any semblance of a Department of Justice investigation, vowing to charge ahead with their mission of, quote, ensuring that every legal vote is counted and every illegal vote is not. Giuliani and Ellis added that again, with the greatest respect to the attorney general, his opinion appears to be without any knowledge or investigation of the substantial irregularities and evidence of systemic fraud. Wow, so they are still going along with this fraud that there is fraud. And it's just, it's honestly almost impressive at this point that they're still saying this. Oh, well, I'm sorry, with all due respect to the Attorney General, you just don't have the knowledge that we have. All right, well, why don't you enlighten us, present us with the knowledge that we all lack that you have. We're not privy to what you're privy to, so why don't you show us the evidence? Oh, wait, you can't do that. You've had numerous attempts to do that, and you have nothing. Because voter fraud is not an issue. It did not tip the scales against Donald Trump. Voter fraud is statistically insignificant, with a rate of 0.0025%. That's not enough to tip an election. And even if the fraud rate was higher, Joe Biden won enough states to where he still is the rightful winner. And for you to deny that at this point, it shows how fucking stupid you are. And I just, I honestly feel bad kind of for them, but not really because it's like, you can tell that they don't believe what they're saying. Like when you listen to Jenna Ellis in any interview that she's been on, she doesn't believe what she's saying. There's no way. Like she has a bunch of tweets that I don't know if they're still up, but she was clowning on Donald Trump saying how stupid he was. And now she's very clearly acting for whatever reason, because she wants to boost her career. But I mean, there's, there's no basis in reality. Like these folks are delusional and it's just, it's shocking how they don't have any dignity whatsoever. Like, they don't even care how shameless they look. You have these press conferences with uh, Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani where he has black liquid seeping out of his brain. Amazing. And you have Sidney Powell claiming that Venezuela is, you know, in control of the Dominion voting systems and whatnot. You have memes spreading misinformation going online, that the tagline of Dominion is changing the way people vote, which is not their tagline. It just makes it seem nefarious. You have Donald Trump sitting at this tiny desk, lashing at it, reporters saying, don't ever talk to the president that way. Like, what are, what are we watching here? It's like a parody of American politics. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it, it's, <sighs> You know, you'd think that we'd be desensitized to all of this, having lived through multiple years of a Trump presidency, but like he continues to amaze me in, in the most embarrassing uh, way imaginable. I just, I don't know how long they're going to continue this. Perhaps, you know, on the 14th when it's official and the Electoral College uh, confirms that Joe Biden is the winner, maybe then, I just... It seems like they're not going to stop regardless of how cornered they are. Like, they're going to keep going with it. And it's just, it's honestly impressive in a weird way, I have to say. Because it's like, holy shit. I mean, Jesus Christ. You are like, it, it doesn't even matter. You're still going with this. I, I don't, there's not an appropriate analogy to compare this to. It's just mind-blowing, honestly. So, yeah, Bill Barr is now, um... He's, he's going to be hated in MAGA circles, and I, I'm really curious to see how Trump will respond. Uh, I'm interested in watching the fallout. Look, folks, grab the popcorn because there's no way that Trump can actually steal the election at this point. Too many states have certified. It's over, and he's out. So we don't have to worry any longer. But now we can watch and just be entertained by what is uh, very clearly a fucking uh, clown show that we are witnessing. In an interview with Stefan Colbert, former President Barack Obama was asked if he had a message to older generations still in control within the Democratic Party. And what he said stood out to me because he may have broken the hypocrisy meter. And it's just for him, of all people, to say what he is going to say, it's just ridiculous. 
Um, now, I can't play the video clip for you because this is a CBS clip and I don't want this to be copyright claimed. Uh, so we'll just listen to the audio. It's really quick. It's just a minute long. But listen to what Obama says when asked what his message is to older generations. Get out of the way. Okay, Boomer. <laughs> we, we, uh, I, I, I will say that um, I am so optimistic about uh, our kids and they're smarter than we were, they're more sophisticated, they're kinder, they're environmentally more conscious. They, they believed in stuff, as I write in the preface, that maybe we gave lip service to but didn't always want to live out because mm -hmm. it required some sacrifice. Or, uh, and, and you see them living out their commitments in really powerful ways. Um, but we have, to, we have to be willing to give them uh, the, the chance to remake institutions and change old habits. Um, so I'm, th they make me optimistic. I just want to make sure that we don't screw things up so bad that by the time uh, they're in charge that uh, you know, it, it, uh, it becomes that much harder. Mind blown. Because Barack Obama literally intervened in the Democratic Party primary to stop the candidate that was overwhelmingly supported by young people. Had he not picked up the phone and made calls to uh, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and told them to get behind Joe Biden, we would have somebody who is a different president right now other than Joe Biden. It would be Bernie Sanders. And let me remind you that Joe Biden struggled to get support of young people during the primaries. Now, you know, it seems like I'm crying over spilled milk, but for Obama to say this and just not expect to be called out, it's it's infuriating to me. And he has plausible de deniability because, you know, there's there's only reports that uh, confirmed that he talked to Pete Buttigieg, and we don't necessarily know what they said. We can't confirm that he said, hey, Pete, get out back Joe Biden, but I mean, come on, this is the way that the game is played. All of a sudden, there are reports popping up that Obama talked to Beto O'Rourke, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and then they're getting behind Joe Biden inexplicably. I mean, this isn't a coincidence. He wasn't being inconspicuous in very clearly moving heaven and earth to clear, you know, a path for Joe Biden. Had it not been for Bloody Monday, Bernie Sanders very likely could have been the president-elect right now. And, you know, people are going to say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're just an upset Bernie, bro. You're mad because you lost. Damn right, I'm a sore loser. I am a sore loser. Because guess what? When so much is on the line, I mean, you can't not be a sore loser. People's lives are at stake. And Joe Biden is just not going to cut it. He's stacking his cabinet with warmongers and corporatists like Neera Tandon. So I'm sorry, but when we had a chance to actually elect someone who cared, Obama is the individual who maybe single-handedly stopped that from happening. Now, look, I blame Bernie Sanders for what happened as well, because he should have anticipated shenanigans from the Democratic Party establishment, including Barack Obama. But still, what Obama did was intervene to stop young people from getting the candidate that they supported. But let's listen to what Obama says here. Young people are smarter than we were. They're more sophisticated. They're kinder. They're environmentally more conscious. So, you know, it seems as if he really trusts us and trusts our judgment. Uh, and he says that we believe in stuff that his generation gave lip service to but didn't always want to live out. But you didn't trust us because you intervened to stop us, to stop Bernie Sanders, the candidate who young people overwhelmingly supported, from winning. Uh, he also says we have to give young people the chance to remake institutions and change old habits. Again, we tried to do that with Bernie Sanders, but you you stopped that. You intervened to stop that, to tell everyone to get behind Joe Biden. Obama was able to accomplish what the GOP establishment wished they could have pulled off during the 2016 Republican Party primaries. He also says that young people make him optimistic. I just want to make sure we don't screw things up so bad by the time they're in charge, it becomes that much harder. Well, uh, too late, buddy. You did just that. You did just that. And it's much worse. Like, the thing about Barack Obama is that a lot of us, like, we found our political identity at the time when he was running for president. And I, you know, I became politically active around 2007, 2008 because I grew up seeing the Iraq war and how disastrous it was. So I thought Obama would be different. I supported him over Hillary Clinton because of his anti-war 
position. He was against the Iraq War. Hillary Clinton was not. But what did he do? He duped an entire generation of millennials into supporting him. And what happened? He made all of us see that the Democratic Party establishment, no matter what kind of rhetoric they use, they don't give a damn about us. They're going to say one thing, and as soon as they get into power, they're going to do something entirely different. Obama went on to describe himself as basically a moderate Republican. And we saw that in action. I mean, did his health care plan reflect what we wanted in single payer? No, he literally adopted a right-wing health care plan to appease Republicans, and they still didn't support that. So he showed us that... Uh, <laughs> The Democratic Party is completely and utterly full of shit. And he made an entire generation, my generation, cynical of politics. And in a way, I'm thankful that he allowed us to take off the blinders, right, and see the Democratic Party establishment for what it really is. But for you, after betraying all of us, betraying an entire generation, turning people off to politics after getting them activated... For you to say something like this, oh, old people, get out of the way. Why don't you take your own fucking advice, Obama? Your legacy is garbage. How many families did you uh, destroy in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia? So nobody wants to hear from you right now. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. Uh, someone who's a former Obama Kool-Aid drinker doesn't want to hear from you right now. And I think it's incumbent on millennials who were fucked over by Obama to explain to people why this individual is not your friend. I mean, if you look at the response to Obama within the Democratic Party, like just the base, they still love him and worship him and they hang on to every single word that he says. But this individual is not your ally. He's your enemy and he is to be opposed. He's the individual who should be getting out of the way for the future gener generation to come in. But Obama really is the final boss of liberalism because so long as he has legitimacy and influence in the Democratic Party primary, we're not going to get a President AOC. We're not going to get a President Nina Turner because we now know that all it takes is Barack Obama to make some phone calls and then everyone just rolls over and dies for whoever Obama chooses to anoint. How despicable is that? I mean, stand for something. Stand up to Obama, but nobody wants to attack Obama, even AOC you know, was doing apologia for Obama in a CNN interview because it's like, you know, you, you just, you can't say anything about the God, Obama, the Holy One. Otherwise, you know, you are delegitimized. But I'm here to say, fuck that and fuck Obama. Obama is a terrible human being who should share a jail cell with Donald Trump for committing crimes against humanity. And anyone who worships him is either ignorant or morally bankrupt. And that's all I'll say. We have to, at every turn, educate people about who Barack Obama is. Take the blinders off and acknowledge this individual is a war criminal and he is going to do everything in his power to stop future generations from remaking institutions. But yet... He says, oh, let's, let's let the new generation take over. Yeah, why don't you let that happen? Why didn't you let that happen? And going forward, he's not going to let that happen. Because Obama still is in control of the Democratic Party. And so long as that is the case, change is going to be incredibly difficult to achieve. So former President Barack Obama is promoting his new book because apparently he's not rich enough. So he has to publish a 20th book or something like that. But as a result of this promotion that he's doing, he is appearing on various news programs and he's weighing in on modern political issues. And, you know, a lot of people respect what he says because he's a former president and basically he is a god to the Democratic Party's base. But the more he speaks, the more that he demonstrates how out of touch he is. Case in point, this is what he said about defund the police. As The Hill reports, Obama says you lose people with snappy slogans like defund the police. He then adds the key is deciding do you want to actually get something done or do you want to feel good among the people you already agree with? How very condescending of him. I, uh, I can't take it. Obama is more smug and insufferable than ever, and it's really, really important for people with credibility to call him out and denounce what he's saying, because what he's saying is wrong. First of all, Republicans never think about what is or isn't popular. They just support the policies that their base wants. Banning abortion, banning same-sex marriage, they don't care, but yet they still somehow manage to win elections. How do they do that? It's only Democrats 
who are worried about what is or isn't popular. Second of all, if we're just basically going to uh, decide to support policies that are popular and not base our decision to support said policies on their efficacy, why aren't Democrats supporting policies like Medicare for All, which they know works and they know is very popular? Why aren't they supporting the Green New Deal? Why aren't they supporting legalizing recreational marijuana? Do you understand? It's a double standard. The things that you like... Even though they're popular, we're not going to support them. But the things that aren't popular that you also support, that's what we're going to criticize you for while we don't get on board with popular policies. Either you care about the popularity of policies or you don't. Now, I think that Carlos Maza put it best when he said, I remember all the polling suggesting that same-sex marriage was an election loser and that queer people should opt for lesser protections if they wanted to win at the ballot box. Grateful for every activist who says, we don't care what's popular, we care what's right. There will always, always be scared pundits and political operatives asking activists to soften their language in order to win elections. It's the job of activists to ignore those people completely and fight hard at every turn to yank the Overton window towards justice. Justice. And he adds, everything in politics is too extreme until you fight for it. And that's exactly it. I don't care about what's popular. I care about what's right. And if Americans aren't on the side of a good policy that works, that's morally right, then we have to make them get on our side, make the case for it, educate people. Now, I um, recently uh, shared my dismay at the fact that nobody seems willing to want to criticize Obama. Like, he says terrible things uh, and unpopular things and incorrect things, quite frankly, and nobody will take a shot at him and say, you're wrong on this. Why? Because he has legitimacy. And I've said it once, I'll say it again. So long as Obama has legitimacy, it's going to be very difficult to make any progress because all it takes is Obama saying, we shouldn't do X or Y. And then the Democratic Party, their base, like good little soldiers, will fall in line. But you have to challenge people, challenge these individuals who are standing in the way. I mean, Obama himself said older politicians need to get out of the way and make way for young generations, but he needs to take his own fucking advice. But thankfully, what we saw in response to Obama saying that we shouldn't use phrasing like defund the police was a lot of pushback from progressive leftist lawmakers and this was honestly really encouraging to see because it's super important. People who are popular need to speak up and actually challenge the incorrect things that Obama says. And boy, do they do that. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted out, What if activists aren't PR firms for politicians and their demands are because police budgets are exploding, community resources are shrinking to bankroll it, and people brought this up for ages, but it wasn't until they said defund that comfortable people started paying attention to brutality. The thing that critics of activists don't get is that they tried playing the polite language policy game and all it did was make them easier to ignore. It wasn't until they made folks uncomfortable that there was traction to do anything, even if it wasn't their full demands. Cory Bush then responded saying, with all due respect, Mr. President, let's talk about losing people. We lost Michael Brown Jr. We lost Breonna Taylor. We're losing our loved ones to police violence. It's not a slogan. It's a mandate for keeping our people alive. Defund the police. Ilhan Omar responded saying, we lose people in the hands of police. It's not a slogan, but a policy demand. And centering the demand for equitable investments and budgets for communities across the country gets us progress and safety. Ayanna Presley responded saying, the murders of generations of unarmed black folks by police have been horrific. Lives are at stake daily, so I'm out of patience with critiques of the language of activists. Whatever a grieving family says is their truth, and I'll never stop fighting for their justice and healing. Rashida Tlaib says, Rosa Parks was vilified and attacked for her civil disobedience. She was targeted. It's hard seeing the same people who uplift her courage attack the movement for black lives that want us to prioritize health, funding of schools, and ending poverty rather than racist police systems. And probably my favorite response to Obama is this one from Jamal Bowman who says, Damn, Mr. President, didn't you say Trayvon could have been my son? In 2014, Black Lives Matter was too much. In 2016, Kaepernick was too much. Today, discussing police budgets is too much. The problem is America's comfort with black death, not discomfort with slogans. And to that, I say... Well done. That deserves a slow clap. That's phenomenal. I cannot tell you how encouraging it is to see young, popular lawmakers stand up to what Obama is saying. Because when I saw Obama say this, my first instinct was, oh God, now all of a sudden, 
everyone's going to be attacking to fund the police, the media, and there's going to be no pushback. And since the God Obama said it, then, you know, it is done. Everyone has to go along with what he says because we worship him. But that's not what we're seeing. Thankfully, we're seeing people call out Obama. And what Jamal Bowman speaks to here is so important. If you're more uncomfortable with a slogan than you are with black Americans dying at the hands of police, it's not the sloganeers who have the problem. It's not the activists who created the slogan that have the problem. You're the one with the problem. You are the one who needs to reevaluate your priorities. And for all of these progressive lawmakers to call out Barack Obama here, this is so important. Obama has been a really prominent moderating force in the Democratic Party, and he's also a movement killer. I mean, let's all remember that back in March, all he had to do to end Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign was pick up the phone and make a couple of calls to people to judge Amy Klobuchar and get them to drop out. And of course, they listened and they jumped, right? Obama says, jump, they say how high. That's the way that they respond to Barack Obama. So to see this, it really almost feels like a paradigm shift. And on top of that, when the NBA was going to end up striking, doing something really meaningful, it was Obama that stopped that. Like, he is a movement killer. And I've described him as the final boss of liberalism, and I still think that that descriptor is apt because that's what he does. Like, he has so much credibility and legitimacy that he can basically say whatever he wants and anything that he says by definition is true because it came from his lips. And that's unacceptable. Barack Obama is a fallible human being, and in fact, he's a bad human being. He's a war criminal who murdered countless civilians in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. So the fact that it's taken this long for anyone to criticize him, even tepidly, is a little bit depressing, but I mean, baby steps, right? The fact that so many progressives are speaking out against Obama here, that's important. It tells us that Obama isn't infallible. He can say something too extreme for people, and they will criticize him. That's that's so important. So this is a small step in the right direction, but um, I'll take it. I really give credit to the progressives who called him out because what he's saying is wrong and he needs to be called out. I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone because more and more I'm seeing clips from The View that don't completely make me lose my mind. Like a couple of weeks ago, they talked about the election and, you know, they brought up Abigail Spanberger's criticism of the left and how she believes that defund the police and Medicare for all and, you know, the label of socialism led to Democrats losing seats in the House. And when I saw The View put out a segment where they talk about this, you know, I kind of braced myself because I expected them to have a really, really terrible take. But surprisingly, they were all reasonable. The conversation that they had about this was substantive and furthermore, it was correct. They talked about how, you know, the incumbent Democrats that support Medicare for All actually won re-election, and it's a very popular policy. Uh, so when I saw them talk about something that Obama said lately with regard to defund the police and how Democrats shouldn't say it, once again, I braced myself because I figured that that last segment was just an outlier. But once again, we saw a pretty substantive discussion, uh, but not as much as the last one, not as not as a uh, Good as the last one, I should say, because Sonny Hostin really was the voice of reason on this panel, and she got pushback. Sonny Hostin actually called out Barack Obama and disagreed with him, which is something you almost never see in mainstream media. Uh, and she got pushback, but I do want to respond to some of the points made by individuals who disagree with her, because I think that there is a kernel of truth to what they're saying, but it's just, it's not applicable to defund the police. And I think that Sonny Hostin basically explains perfectly why that's the case. So take a look. Former President Obama has been commenting on the current state of politics in recent interviews, and he's warning progressive Democrats to be careful how they pitch their platforms. Take a look. If you believe, as, as I do, that we should be able to reform the criminal justice system so that it's not biased and treats everybody fairly, I guess you can use a snappy slogan like, defund the police, but you know you've lost a big audience the minute you say it, which makes it a lot less likely that you're actually going to get the changes you want done. Right. So does he have a point here, Sonny? You know, I'm always loathe to um, criticize President Obama because I'm such a fan, but I do think he's wrong here. I mean, when you think about defund the police, that's not a term that was crowdsourced or tested in focus groups. You know, that's a term that was born, um, a rallying cry that was born out of this over-policing of black and brown communities, born out of the frustration of seeing black and brown men and women killed in the streets by police officers. And defunding the police does not mean for the 
hundredth time I've explained, it does not mean uh, eliminating police departments. It doesn't mean stripping agencies for all of their money. It's reimagining policing in this country to address systemic racism. We defund school programs all the time and they call it defunding school programs, yet no one seems to have a problem with that. But people all of a sudden have a problem with defunding the police, that term. And I don't think you should allow people to co-opt the movement and, and tell protesters what language they should use. I think, you know, President Obama was a community organizer, and I really think that he, uh, you know, knows better. I spoke to my good friend, Alicia Garza. You, you guys have met her, and she co-founded the Black Lives Matter movement. She told me when they first came up with the Black Lives Matter movement, Movement, people told her that they should call it the All Lives Matter movement. Now, I think that that would have been a mistake. No. You know, uh, because that, that well, also was different. born of protesters in the street. Yeah, but, but I think Can what I he's trying with, to say is that people... Yeah. Hold on, hold on a second. I think what he's saying is how people perceived that message and how it was carried through is the problem. That's, I think, what he's saying. Be aware of how you're presenting yourself because people do grab it and run. It's, you know, it, we saw it in uh, Miami. We saw it all over Florida, how people took that message. Didn't matter how many times you said, that's not what it means. People took that because the right kind of grabbed it and turned it into something else. Go ahead, Joy, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, but I think that Sonny came up with a better slogan, reimagine the police. Yeah. That's a good slogan. It's, it's more accurate. The defund the police is not an accurate statement. It has to be more like, here's an accurate statement. Give me liberty or give me death. There you go. And I dated Patrick Henry, so I happen to know that's a good one. But um, the thing about it is it's like <laughs> pro-choice also and pro-life. Those things don't work either. It should be pro-woman. They need to get a slogan that does not make people nuts and defund the police scare well, this what, country. And that's why so many Democrats Well, that's lost. what he's saying. So it's yeah. not working. That's what, yes. I disagree. That's what Obama is saying. I disagree. I know you do, but go I think ahead, you're Sarah. wrong this time, Sonny. Oh, and well, I, I thought you. I'd do it you when I came that. back. I didn't know how much time we had. Do you want me to go? Because I actually, I do uh, agree with President Obama that when there's any confusion, I understand what Sonny is saying, that there's an anger, there's a rage, that you can hear that and agree with where you're going, but not how you get there. And I think what President Obama said uh, resonated with me because I think that if there's any confusion, how do you speak across to more people? It's, you know, um, your friend, uh, Alicia right. Garza said, it's all about math. It's getting more people, not just your community to understand it. And in order right. to do that, you've got to make sure you don't lose some of those people in the messaging, as President Obama said. So but, I, I really appreciated the quote. Oh. But you also said, Guys, I hate to do this to you, but, other people to but we have to go. Movement. So usually when I am critical of The View, Sonny Hostin is uh, the one that I agree with the most, if I'm going to agree with any of them, which is pretty rare, to be honest. Um, but, you know, over the years, she's been growing more and more out of touch. And, you know, I think it was last year, that was basically the straw that broke the camel's back for me when they were all lying about Medicare for All, how popular it is, its efficacy. And that really, that, that irritated me. And I kind of held this grudge uh, against them. But what we saw here from Sonny Hostin I mean, she said everything that I would have said in that predicament. You know, this isn't some sort of uh, slogan that a politician came up with. This manifested organically on the ground. I mean, it's not like abolish ICE where AOC is the one who kind of spoke this into existence. Defund the police came from the bottom up, not the top down. And that makes it very different. Very different. And she says, you know, we talk about reimagining policing in this country to address uh, systemic racism, and we defund school programs all the time. Like, everything she's saying is reasonable. And I think that Jamal Bowman put it best. If you're more uncomfortable with a slogan than black people getting murdered by the police at alarming rates, then, I mean, you're the one with the issue. And it's just a matter of educating people and changing their hearts and minds. I mean, we shouldn't base our policy preferences on what is or isn't popular. We should support policies that are good policies. Now, Joy Behar and the other host disagreed with Sonny Hostin. Joy Behar said we should call it, you know, we imagine the police, it's not working. And she then uses, you know, pro-choice and uh, pro-life 
as a reason why Democrats often miss the mark when it comes to labeling and it should be called pro-woman. Now, I don't agree with what Joy Behar is saying with regard to defund the police because I think that defund the police is very specific. We take the funds that we are giving to police departments and we reallocate them into other social services. So rather than, you know, just calling the police for everything, mental health issues and whatnot, we actually have a social worker come out to deal with mental health crises, you know, something that they're more trained to deal with and not police officers. Like, we can't just have this one-size-fits-all approach to policing. We have to reimagine policing in America. And defund the police, I think, speaks to that. And if it's not popular now, we make it popular. We keep pushing to make sure that this is something that individuals uh, support, right? This is what happened with Medicare for All. It wasn't always as popular as it is now we had to work on it and convince people and we won so you don't run away from something just because it's not popular but i do think that what joy behar is saying about marketing it is important because democrats oftentimes are terrible at marketing and republicans they're pretty effective at marketing and i don't necessarily believe it's because, you know, Republicans are geniuses, I think it's because they're disciplined in their messaging, right? So they say something and initially you'll think, wow, that's really stupid. Nobody's going to believe this. And then they say it so much that it ends up sticking. If Democrats were this disciplined, it wouldn't really matter what the policy is. You just elevate one issue, use an anecdote, and you run with it and you stick to it. And that actually does work. So when it comes to like pro-life and pro-choice, I do think that there is some truth to what uh, Joy Behar is saying, because when you call a Republican who's anti-abortion, pro-life, you're giving them far more credit than they ever would deserve, because these individuals oftentimes who identify as pro-life support bombing other countries. They support wars. You know, they don't think that individuals should be guaranteed health care. That's free at the point of service. So that's not pro-life. So why are we calling them pro-life? Why are we calling ourselves pro-choice when they can easily misconstrue that and say, well, that means that you think that abortion is the pro-choice and not that you know, we're, we're in favor of more freedom for women. Like, these are things that Democrats have to think more deeply about, I think. But it's not even about them, like, getting better at marketing. I think that this is something that Democrats and the left has to work on. Discipline really is the key. Because, you know, when Republicans say something, they're, they're relentless. They have Fox News say it. They have their politicians say it and repeat it. Like, it's the same thing with death panels and Obamacare. Like, all of a sudden, people were worried about death panels because Republicans said that we should fear death panels. And it sounded stupid at first, and it was stupid, but if you say something enough, that raises the salience of that issue. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot to be discussed. I think that this conversation is important. Like, I think that talking about the efficacy of slogans and marketing, it does matter. But when it comes to defund the police, this is something that manifested on the ground, as I stated earlier. So, you know, you can't attack politicians for simply doing what they should be doing, adopting what activists are encouraging them to support. You don't attack the politicians for adopting the slogan of activists. You attack the politicians who don't support this mass movement, perhaps the largest civil rights movement we've seen in America. So, you know, I really give Sunny Hostin credit here because everything that she said was astute. So I think it is absolutely unacceptable that Joe Biden chose Neera Tanden to be the director of the OMB. That is a slap in the face to all of the progressive activists that helped him get elected. Without them, he would have lost this election. And that's how he repays them. It's not shocking, but it's still infuriating. Uh, on top of that, I think it's absolutely outrageous that he's even considering Rahm Emanuel to be transportation secretary, even if it doesn't happen. Again, the mere fact that he's considering someone that egregious who covered up the murder of Laquan McDonald is completely disgusting and morally reprehensible. So he's made some bad choices, some other meh choices, and choices that I think are inoffensive. But who he is considering to be HHS secretary... Maybe the worst pick he's considered yet.
So as Julia Rock and Andrew Perez of the Daily Post report, Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo has presided over one of the deadliest COVID outbreaks in the country, and new documents obtained by the Daily Poster detail how she helped nursing home lobbyists shield healthcare companies from coronavirus-related lawsuits. Now, Raimondo, a former Wall Street executive, is reportedly considered for the nation's top healthcare policy job in the incoming Biden administration. Politico reported last week that Raimondo, who made her name slashing state workers' pensions, is one of the finalists to lead the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under President-elect Joe Biden. Raimondo was also previously considered for Treasury Secretary, according to the American Prospect, as Governor Raimondo has slammed proposals to expand Medicare to cover everyone. Amid the pandemic in August, her administration approved health insurance companies' steep premium increases that were criticized by the state's Democratic Attorney General as unnecessary and ill-advised. Health insurers have been raking in record profits with fewer people seeking health care because of the pandemic. Raimondo has also pushed for Medicaid cuts that nursing home workers warned would result in unsafe staffing levels. And in April, she issued an executive order sought by healthcare industry lobbyists that shielded nursing homes from lawsuits when their business decisions injure or kill people. The order was later expanded to shield nursing homes, hospitals, and other healthcare providers. While the Biden transition team is reportedly considering Raimondo for HHS secretary, residents and workers in Rhode Island's nursing homes have faced deadly consequences. Documents obtained by the Daily Poster show that Raimondo quickly responded to lobbyists' demands for an executive order granting them legal immunity during the pandemic. Rhode Island currently has one of the highest coronavirus death rates by population in the country, according to data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. More than 70% of COVID-19 deaths in the state have been linked to long-term care facilities. Only two other states have seen similar nursing home death rates, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. This is outrageous to me. She shouldn't just be disqualified from being the HHS secretary, given this information. She should be run out of politics forever, never be able to get a job in politics again. Understand why this is so scandalous. In her state, more than 70% of COVID-19 deaths are linked to long-term care facilities. Rather than cracking down on them, regulating them more, what does she do? She issues an executive order that gives them legal immunity during this pandemic. That's not just a bad politician. That is someone who is morally bankrupt. If these long-term care facilities aren't going to take adequate care of their uh, residents, they should be sued. But she's saying, no, even though they're linked to most of the COVID cases in my state, we're going to give them legal immunity. I'm going to listen to lobbyists. This is completely unacceptable and egregious. Like, I'm almost speechless because this is so brazen. So brazen. So if Biden chooses her, this would be a disaster. This would be the individual in control of healthcare in the country. This is the top healthcare job in America. It's just the fact that this is even someone who he's being considered is unacceptable and I'll, I'll reserve judgment for if she is considered but I think that now is the time for people to sound the alarms because people have to know this individual should be nowhere near this job given what she just did this is corruption and it may not necessarily be a quid pro quo but it's still corruption nonetheless to respond and comply with the demands of lobbyists at a time where she should be cracking down on these long-term care facilities but instead she's protecting them She's not looking out for the people. She's looking out for special interests, these, you know, uh, lobbyists and companies that likely contributed to her campaign. It's just disgusting. And I think that everyone needs to know about this. I find it very irritating that even though individuals like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib helped deliver Michigan and Minnesota to Joe Biden, they're kind of discounted. Like the things that they say about policy they're brushed aside. Like we saw Obama call out this slogan of defund the police, criticizing them basically inadvertently and indirectly. But individuals like John Kasich, who failed to deliver Ohio to Joe Biden, they're propped up as uh, arbiters of truth in the Democratic Party. And this Republican supposedly is supposed to tell the Democratic Party what they should and shouldn't be doing. Meanwhile, he should be more concerned with the Republican Party. He was driven out of his own party by the far right. 
So now what he wants to do, since he's no longer welcome in his party, is remake the Democratic Party in his own image. But thankfully for John Kasich, it already is basically in his own image. You have more individuals like Joe Manchin and Dianne Feinstein that are closer to him ideologically than you actually do have leftist individuals. But nonetheless, in an interview with CNN, they asked him, you know, um, what he thought about the Democratic Party, what they should be doing, you know, the, the thing that they usually ask him as if, we should be taking into account what he says. Uh, and of course, he's going to say something that is incredibly wrong and insufferable. Take a look. I do want to ask you about the future direction of the Democratic Party for a second, because President Obama did it really in, had an interesting take on the future of the party in a new interview with Peter Hamby on Snapchat. Let me play just a bit of it. We stick so long with the same old folks and don't make room for new voices. You know, the fact that an AOC only got, what, three minutes or five minutes. Good evening, bienvenidos, and thank you. When, you know, she speaks to a broad section of young people who are interested in what she has to say, even if they don't agree with everything she says, new blood's always good. New blood's always good. What do you think about that? Well, I think he was just, he was asked a direct question and he didn't want to take a swipe at her, but he also said something very interesting in that interview, and that is using these slogans like defund the police or Green New Deal, he says they're snappy slogans that only appeal to people that agree with them. You're an Indiana girl. You know, imagine going over there to Indiana and starting to try to promote a platform about defund the police. Even Congressman Clyburn from South Carolina, uh, the, you know, the African-American leader who really saved Joe Biden's bacon down in South Carolina by Biden winning the primary, said he thinks this kind of language around defunding the police probably cost a congressional race in South Carolina. So on one hand, I think he's trying to say, yeah, we need new ideas, we need new voices. I happen to agree with that. But he's also at the same time saying, use these slogans like defund the police or green, new green deal, or which labels socialist and all that other stuff. I think it absolutely hurt the Democratic Party. And I said on, on election day, well, whenever we were announced the winner here on CNN, I said it was the hard left that I thought put the, put the uh, Joe Biden's uh, ability to become president in jeopardy. Because people, these cultural issues, Kate, in our rural areas, our towns where the factories are forgotten, uh, all across the country, down in, in Miami-Dade and South Florida, these issues of culture really matter to voters. And I think it's a struggle inside the Democratic Party. So what we're seeing here, what he's speaking to really is a double standard that politicians and the media, they just, they never acknowledge because the Republican Party, they can support election losers, even though a majority of Americans support keeping abortion legal and same-sex marriages. It is in the Republican Party's platform to repeal same-sex marriage, to make abortions illegal. But yet nobody speaks to how much of a political loser that is for Republicans. Nobody speaks about how unpopular it is to deny the reality of anthropogenic climate change. It's always what is a good policy that we talk about whether or not that's an election loser. It's almost as if corporate media and these politicians don't want to support policies because their donors and advertisers wouldn't like them getting behind something that actually is popular. So, I mean, if you're going to care about what is or isn't popular, let's be consistent. Why aren't we talking about how not supporting Medicare for all is an election loser? As we saw in this last election, any incumbent Democrat who did not support Medicare for all lost their race, whereas incumbent Democrats that supported Medicare for all won their races. Why aren't we having this broad conversation in the media about how not supporting Medicare for all is an election loser? Well, because your big pharma health industry advertisers wouldn't like that, and the donors to Democrats in the health industry wouldn't like that conversation as well. So we kind of narrow the scope of that conversation to cultural issues and issues that don't necessarily offend our donors and advertisers, and that's why we see this double standard perpetuated. And it's infuriating. It is infuriating, because if John Kasich was serious about what is popular or not popular, you think he'd be focusing on his party, which has been taken over by the far right and literally drove him out, but instead, he's more concerned about the Democratic Party. Does that make sense to you? Go fix your own fucking party before you try to fix the Democratic Party. Your input is not needed because we already have countless Republicans in the Democratic Party, Joe Biden being one of them. Now,
until the media starts talking about how making abortion illegal is a political loser or taking away healthcare during a pandemic is a political loser, I don't really have the patience to listen to them pontificate about what is or isn't a political loser. I don't want to hear them talk about how defund the police is unpopular because they're not being serious. They're not good faith actors here when they're having this conversation. Now, I have to talk about how Obama, uh, they played a clip of an interview with him where he criticized older Democrats for taking up too much time at the DNC convention, and AOC was only given, you know, a few minutes. Obama, do I have to remind you who you are? You're Obama. You're the guy who made a phone call and ended the presidential campaign of the candidate that was supported overwhelmingly by young people. So for him to continuously say, we, we need to get out of the way, get out of the way, older politicians need to make room at the table for these, you know, n new up-and-comers, you keep saying that, but you're not taking your own advice. So I'm not going to make this about Obama because I already made my video criticizing Barack Obama. But here's the thing. The Democratic Party, they have institutional incentives to not want to change. Donors from spe special interests. That is what's keeping them from supporting popular policies like Medicare for all or legalizing recreational cannabis, not some ideological differences. So let's get that straight. But the most important thing that I want to say about this, as trivial as it sounds, is that nobody should be taking anything that a union buster and Republican is saying about the Democratic Party's politics. Like what he says about the Democratic Party Nobody should be taking it seriously. Had he delivered Ohio to Joe Biden, maybe you could say, all right, well, I mean, he he helped deliver this victory to the Democratic Party. Maybe we should listen to some of what he says and take it with a grain of salt. You couldn't even deliver the state that you were the governor of to Joe Biden. So why would we care about the advice that you're offering to Democrats? So that's the most important thing I could say. Nobody cares what you think, John Kasich. Go away. You're irrelevant politically. It seems like whenever Ben Shapiro is reminded that transgender people exist, he has another meltdown. So whenever there's some sort of news related to transgender issues or a transgender celebrity comes out, he freaks out and he reiterates to everyone why he is a terrible person and doesn't want to respect who they are. Now, we'll talk about Ben Shapiro, but let me just weigh in uh, and give you my opinion. Usually, I don't care about celebrity-related news, but I think that Elliot Page coming out is really important because culture matters, and there's, like, no representation for trans, trans people. So if you're, like, a young trans individual or non-binary individual, you have nobody to look up to, nobody who, you know, you see reflected in media. And that really does matter because we haven't had that cultural revolution when it comes to transgender issues and non-binary issues. So whenever there is a celebrity that speaks up or comes out as trans, I think that that really is significant culturally because that, that gives trans youth who are statistically more likely to do self-harm someone to look up to, someone like them, you know, and, and to see the positive response to Elliot Page coming out. I think that that matters, and it, it seems trivial if, if you don't know, you know, uh, how important this is, if you're not trans yourself. But it really does matter. I, I promise you it does matter. Like seeing gay celebrities as a child, that really, that was important. Even if back then when I was young, I didn't know that I was gay or identify as gay. Like, you know, I knew I was different. But seeing that, it, it helped me to grow and become the person who, you know, I ultimately was, which is a gay dude. Uh, so Elliot came out. And Ben Shapiro responded uh, as we'd expect Ben Shapiro to respond. He was offended at the fact that Elliot Page decided to come out. Um, so we're going to talk about what he said. Uh, but first, of course, let's watch. Ellen Page can identify however she wants. I don't care. L really, it makes no difference to me. She is an adult human. She can do whatever she wants. It is a free country. However, it being a free country, I am also free to point out that Ellen Page is, was, and shall remain a woman. Because Ellen Page is, in fact, a woman. Now, I'm happy to call Ellen Page Elliot if she wants to be called Elliot because people change their names all the time. And you can, in fact, change your name by declaration. You cannot, however, change your sex by declaration or your gender by declaration. That is not how this works. There is no other area of life in which people simply declare themselves to be a thing and everybody goes, oh, OK. Right. And an objectively verifiable thing right there. You can declare your sexual orientation. Or you can declare a thing that you like. You can declare that you're a fan of this particular band. You can declare that you have a sexual attraction to X, Y, or Z, right? That's all subjective. And all we have to go on is your behavior, which is objective and your subjective self-assessment. However, when you're declaring something 
as core as your sex? There is no objectifiable, no objective measure whatsoever whereby Ellen Page is a man. None. Right? She is a woman. And yet we are immediately told by the media that to even address Ellen Page or Elliot Page as a she is discriminatory. It's very bad and very discriminatory. And so you end up with complete inanities and insanities. Okay, so Ellen Page declared that she is now a man, okay? But she also declared that she is a queer man. Now, this is confusing because if she were a queer man, this would mean that she is attracted to men, which would technically mean that she's a straight woman, right? <laughs> because if she is a, an actual woman attracted to men, this would make her a straight woman. But we know she's not that because she was a lesbian, right? So she is married to a woman, as far as I'm aware. And that means that she is a lesbian, but now she is a man. And according to her, this means that she is a white straight male. So how is she queer? She's a white straight male. So here is how Wikipedia tries to sum this up. You ready for this? According to Wikipedia, in, in, in J January 2018, Page publicly announced his marriage to dancer and choreographer Emma Portner. So this means that Ellen Page is a gay man married to a woman, according to Wikipedia, which makes no sense at all. Like, in any way, shape, or form. It's irritating to me because he's trying to prove to people that he's not an asshole, that he wants to respect Elliot, but he goes out of his way to dead name Elliot Page and misgender Elliot Page throughout the entire video. See, I, if Elliot wants to be called Elliot, that's fine. I'm just going to keep dead naming Elliot and misgendering Elliot on purpose. And if you watch the interview that he did with uh, Joe Rogan when he was talking about Laverne Cox, he had to go out of his way to misgender Laverne Cox. And he accidentally, uh, at least <laughs> accidentally to him, used the correct pronouns, which are she. Transgender woman from uh, Orange is the New Black. I never watched that show. I've never watched that show either, but she's on the cover of Time Magazine. Oh. Or he's on the cover of Time Magazine. Gotcha, bitch. Trans people exist. That's the bottom line, and you can either choose to acknowledge that fact and get over it and try to treat them re with respect, so that way they don't want to hurt themselves, so society becomes more accepting to them, or you can continue to be an asshole and throw a temper tantrum whenever somebody else comes out as transgender, or tra transgender people, or non-binary people make any sort of progress whatsoever. But it's Ben Shapiro, he is a regressive, and um, he, he doesn't want to see anyone who doesn't fit into the box that he has created culturally to succeed. So that's why he throws these temper tantrums. That's why he's triggered by the thought that trans people exist. Now he says, you can in fact change your name by declaration. You cannot, however, change your sex by declaration or your gender by declaration. Um, actually, you can. And what he is refusing to acknowledge is the difference between sex and and gender. And this is what Republicans do. They pretend as if sex and gender are the same thing. They might be related, but they are not the same thing. Sex refers to what is in between your legs, whereas gender is your expression, right? The expression of masculinity or femininity or none of the above. You could be non-binary. There are people who I know who don't fit into either of these two binary, you know, gender systems. So it, it, it's not as easy as he wants you to believe. He's oversimplifying it and he's saying, look, all this comes down to is, do you have a penis or a vagina? If you have a vagina, then I have to refer to you using a she, her pronouns. If you have a penis, then you're a man. And I'm going to refer to you as, uh, you know, having he, him pronouns. But it's not that simple because let's assume for a moment that Ben Shapiro had a vagina. If that were the case, then wouldn't it be weird using his measures to like refer to Ben Shapiro as her? Because He's a father. He's a husband. He is heterosexual. He identifies as a male. Because, I mean, think about this. In public, you don't assess whether or not someone is man or woman based on if they have a penis or vagina. Because you can't tell. Because human beings wear clothes if they are normal. So, you know, we base our judgment on these issues on gender cues. You know, the way that someone looks or acts. Their clothes. Not their penis or their vagina. Yes, sex refers to biology. Gender does not refer to biology. It is an expression. So he tries to, like, narrowly define what it means to be male or female when that's just, that's not reasonable. Just simply saying, well, you're a man or a woman, depending on what you have between your legs, that's not realistic. It's not realistic. Life is more complicated than that. It's not just about biology. That's not what gender refers to. Hence why there's a difference between sex and gender, which conservatives refuse to acknowledge. They say, well, you know, it's the same thing. Sex is a synonym for gender, when in actuality, it literally is not. 
Facts don't care about your feelings. Sex is not the same thing as gender. That's a fact. Um, now, he he says that, um, actually, I should be misgendering Ben Shapiro since he was doing that to Elliot. So, uh, Ben Shapiro, she said that um, he doesn't, she doesn't know. See how difficult it is to misgender someone on purpose? Uh, she doesn't know whether or not Elliot is straight or gay because Elliot is married to a woman but still identifies as queer. And he bases this off of the Wikipedia page. Look, at the end of the day, this is my response. Why do you care so much? Stop caring so much. Like, it's so weird to me that he focuses on this so much and spends so much time trying to think about somebody else and what they identify as, who they sleep with, what they have between their legs. If you're not transgender or gay or non-binary, get over it. Like, that's that's the easiest thing that I can say to maybe ameliorate your, your suffering right now. Stop thinking about it. But I suspect that the reason why individuals who are, like, openly homophobic or openly transphobic, like Ben Shapiro, Stephen Crowder, is because there's some struggle going on with them. And, of course, this this is just speculation, but there was an article that recently dropped where a Hungarian politician who was anti-gay was caught attending an orgy with 25 men. And I think that that story is relevant because usually the loudest homophobes and transphobes are usually in the closet, Right? They're projecting uh, their denial onto the rest of the world, right? And so maybe it's the case that Ben Shapiro is transgender and he doesn't want to come out as transgender, you know? So so he will completely tell himself, I, I can't be a woman, I can't be a woman, I have a penis, I have a penis, I have a penis. And like he has to say that over and over again. And it's almost to the point where it's like, well, who are you trying to convince? Are you trying to convince us or yourself? And the same is true for Steven Crowder, where he like, was harping away at uh, how bad it is to be gay and was harassing Carlos Maza for over a year. And you, you've got to ask, why do you care this much? It quite literally does not affect your life. Again, gay and trans people are going to exist like it or not. Are you going to choose to let them live in peace and give them equal rights? Or are you going to go out of your way to dead name them and misgender them just to be an asshole so you can smugly say, well, I'm correct because I am, I'm citing science. Like, what you're saying is not just dickish, it's incorrect. They use the science argument, but then they purposefully omit key details that sex and gender are not the same thing. And then they talk about this way more than any normal person would. Like, I'm sure that transgender people haven't thought about trans issues as much as Ben Shapiro has. So that, that begs the question, like, are you suffering yourself? Do you need to come out as trans or gay, Ben? Like, I just, I don't understand it. Like, I, as a gay dude, have not thought about homosexuality as much as some of, of these conservatives have, right? So you have to wonder, why do you care this much? And I'll leave it at that because I think that a lot of this is projection. Like they're trying to convince themselves rather than their audiences. Uh, that or they're just assholes. But regardless, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm really thankful that Elliot came out because, again, this is super important. Trans youth, they don't have many role models, especially ones who are transitioning, right? They learn that someone is transgender usually, but coming out as transgender or non-binary, that's something that still isn't normalized in society. It's very uncommon. So to see this, this is important. Like of all the celebrity news, this is the only thing that actually can have a meaningful impact on people's lives in a positive way because trans youth need to see themselves reflected in people who are popular and famous. And this is, this is important. So, you know, Ben Shapiro can shit on it all he wants, but I think that more people need to question why he thinks about this so much, why every time there's transgender news, he gets so mad. Like, that's not normal to be that mad unless it affects you personally. All right, folks, so I want to talk about a clip from Fox News that by now I'm sure you've either seen or at least heard about. This features Lou Dobbs, and he responds to news that Attorney General William Barr did not find evidence of widespread voter fraud. What you are about to see here is legitimately one of the most unhinged segments that Fox News has ever put out. Good evening, everybody. President Trump, his legal team, members of the Republican Party, making advances today in the battle for the White House. There have been significant developments in six key battleground states, all of which, all of which bolster President Trump's charge that there has been clear electoral fraud fraud that nullified the will of the people in the November election. The president's progress puts him at odds with the insidious rhinos, radical Dems, 
corporate America, big tech, and the deep state who have tried to overthrow his presidency for more than four years. Today, a member of his own cabinet appeared to join in with the radical Dems and the deep state and the resistance. Attorney General William Barr, who has been absent for weeks and weeks, telling the Associated Press that the U.S. attorneys and FBI agents who have followed up on complaints of specific voter fraud across the country have produced nothing. To date, we have not seen fraud on a scale, he said, that could have affected a different outcome in the election. For the Attorney General of the United States to make that statement, he is either a liar or a fool or both. He may be uh, perhaps compromised. He may be simply unprincipled. Or he may be personally distraught or ill. But in no way can he honestly stand up before the American people and say that the FBI has, with any integrity or intensity, investigated voter fraud in this country and then say it did not amount to anything. Wow. I am at a loss for words. Even for Fox News, this is a bit much. It's a bit much. And I know that Lou Dobbs is and always has been one of the more reactionary and stupid hosts over at Fox News, even though the bar is low, like he, he's one of the stupidest. I don't even believe that he believes what he's saying. I, I just don't. I think that probably what's happening, although I'm not 100% sure, is that he's just trying to placate the Trump supporters that watch his program. That has to be the case. Because what he's saying is like quite literally the opposite of what's happening. He's saying there have been significant developments in six key battleground states, all of which bolster President Trump's charge that there has been clear electoral fraud. The opposite is happening. There was never a case to begin with, but even the claim that they made is falling apart because of their own stupidity. And even though they're just fabricating claims of fraud, even they can't keep their story straight. They're doing press conferences where Rudy Giuliani literally has black liquid secreting from his head. <laughs> this is a joke, and anyone who buys into this is stupid. I'm sorry, but you're stupid if you believe this. So there's no way that even someone as dumb as Lou Dobbs, and he's a dumb guy, believes this. I think he's trying to placate MAGA chuds. And, and I say this because, like, even the most tepid criticism of the fraud case, that leads to a revolt from MAGA chuds, right? We saw when Tucker Carlson, he simply asked Sidney Powell for evidence, and they turned on him. Laura Ingram tried to let them down easily and say, look, I, we've tried this, you know, but I don't think it's going to work for Donald Trump. I think that he's out. And on January 20th, like it or not, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the next president of the United States. Even just saying that, trying to, you know, tap dance around the truth, try to let them down easily, they still turn on them. So if you want to keep that audience, you have to tell them exactly what they want to hear. They're not tuning into Fox News so they can get this objective take on the news as it is. They want to be told what they want to hear. So Lou Dobbs acknowledges that, and I think that what he's trying to do is placate them. Now, there is a possibility, a strong possibility, that he just is as stupid as as it appears. I mean, Occam's razor, right? But I just, it's hard, even for Lou Dobbs, this is so stupid and so bizarre that I find it difficult to believe that even he would believe this. Uh, but ironically, he says, Bill Barr is either a liar or a fool or both. Projection much? Because that's what we're seeing from you. Either you are a liar or a fool or both. And I would say that regardless if Bill Barr is telling or, or uh, if uh, Lou Dobbs is telling the truth about what he feels with regard to Bill Barr, uh, he's still an idiot and a fool. But to believe this, to believe the opposite of what's happening, where there's been significant developments that could change the result of the election and unnullify the result, I mean, it's just... It's too batshit insane even for Lou Dobbs. Either way, this is unhinged and dangerous. And, you know, what we're starting to see is this whole voter election fraud thing that they're they're trying to perpetuate, it is hurting them, right? They're, they're basically cutting off their noses to spite their faces because it's leading to people wanting to boycott the election 
uh, the runoffs in Georgia, right? Trump supporters specifically, who feel as if, well, if my vote doesn't matter, if Democrats just nullified the election results, why even participate in this sham process? Let's just boycott it all together and say, you know, fuck you to the whole system. So I don't know if that's actually going to be significant enough to actually change the results of the election where that many Trump voters boycott it. Who knows? But uh, what we're seeing here, honestly, like, we're going to look back at this moment. I truly believe this. And it's going to be shocking. Like, we're in the moment right now. So, like, we're kind of just accustomed to this type of unhinged rhetoric on Fox News. But I truly believe that if we don't kill ourselves, that being human beings, we're going to look back at this moment in history and think how much of the population was like actually delusional like we're living in george orwell's 1984 but what's sad is that the individuals who are the most deluded have co-opted 1984 and they're the ones who believes that they actually have the real truth it's just it's a weird era in american politics perhaps one of the weirdest ones and theoretically we should be more informed than ever since we have phones and like unlimited information uh at our fingertips but we're dumber than ever as a society, and you see things like this, where Lou Dobbs is just straight up going on these unhinged rants, saying quite literally the opposite of what's happening. Unreal. <laughs> but entertaining. Entertaining, nonetheless. So it kind of feels as if there is a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to COVID-19, since we now do have multiple vaccines on the way. Having said that, though, even when we reach herd immunity and things get back to normal, or at least some semblance of normal, I don't think many people have truly thought about the long-term aftermath of this pandemic. But right now, before we can even talk about herd, herd immunity, it is ravaging this country. We have 100,000 people in America in hospitals. We saw nearly 3,000 deaths in a single day all while the president does absolutely nothing to contain the virus, he's still complaining about the election that took place last month, as this Business Insider article points out. And I mean, when numbers get so big, it, it's kind of like we, we, we can't even imagine it, right? It's unfathomable, quite literally. So think about this. We're reaching 300,000 deaths due to COVID-19. We may hit 300,000 before the end of the year at the rate we're going. And on top of that, to hit almost 3,000 deaths in a single day, that's comparable to 9-11. So we're seeing the equivalent of a 9-11 take place, and a lot of people don't even realize that it's happening, right? Because we've become so accustomed to it. But I mean, even when we have the vaccines and we reach herd immunity, the long-lasting effects of COVID-19 are going to be there for quite some time, not just in terms of health and the long-term side effects and, you know, lung damage from this virus, but economically speaking, this is going to cause a lot of devastation. But just in the short term, when you look at how many people at home are affected, CBS News reports nearly 19 million Americans could lose their homes when the moratorium on evictions expires on December 31st. But that's just what's happening here at home, because globally, the UN is actually warning that extreme poverty could surge by 2030 without immediate major economic intervention from governments. Now, as Kenny Stansel of Common Dreams reports, a harrowing study released by the United Nations early Thursday reveals that the global coronavirus pandemic is setting the stage for a massive surge in the number of people pushed into poverty worldwide over the next decade, a phenomenon that only immediate interventions in the form of ambitious investments in public health, social safety net programs, and a green transition can help avoid. According to the findings of the new study by the United Nations Development Program, the severe long-term effects of the global pandemic could push an additional 207 million people into extreme poverty over the next decade. On top of the current pandemic trajectory, that would bring the total number of individuals living in extreme poverty to over 1 billion by 2030. This at a time of rampant and nearly unparalleled inequality as the fortunes of the world's richest individuals and families continue to soar. While the UNDP makes clear the looming intensification of poverty is not a foregone conclusion, only with urgent action can such a scenario be avoided. As this new poverty research highlights, the COVID-19 pandemic is at a tipping point, and the choices leaders take now could take the world in very different directions, said UNDP administrator Akim Steiner. 
The analysis considers various recovery pathways and predicts how each one would affect the UN's sustainable development goals. Under the baseline scenario, based on current mortality rates and growth projections, 44 million more people will likely be pushed into extreme poverty by 2030 than would have been expected before the COVID-19 pandemic altered the world's development trajectory. In a high damage scenario in which the recovery is protracted, meaning that 80% of economic productivity losses remain after 10 years, 207 million additional people are projected to be living in poverty, bringing the total number to 1 billion by the end of the decade. Now, I'm not going to assume that the worst case scenario will in fact play out, but even if, you know, we get the uh, the best case scenario, it's still, it looks really grim. And this is after the pandemic. Once we get it under control worldwide, this is the devastation that it caused that will live on. So it's just, it's really, really, um, it's sad to think about all of this because on top of the pandemic, we have a climate catastrophe looming. And, and like, I don't want to be overly grim here because there's only so much that we can focus on without getting too down. But we have to think about these things and really start taking, um, taking action, governmentally speaking. But when you have, you know, worldwide capitalism dominant, how do we even begin to put pressure on governments like if one government is success successfully pressured by its people well there's still other governments that have to take action to mitigate poverty we can't even get the united states government to offer us a second stimulus and what we're seeing so far at the time i record this video is another stimulus that doesn't even give people another payment like in the united states alone the way that we responded to this, to this virus is comparable to what we'd expect from a failed state. And I've said this before, so it sounds kind of redundant, but it really is shocking to see this. We're the richest country in the world, and we saw a one-time payment of $1,200. I just, I don't know what to say. How many businesses are going to go bankrupt before the pandemic is under control? So I don't want this to be a video that makes you know, people overly depressed, but we, we have to grapple with these things. You can only distract yourself for so long until reality catches up with you. And just like thinking about not just the long-term impact caused by this pandemic at home, but worldwide, it really is overwhelming. And as a species, you know, human beings are going to have to come together, not just for this, but climate change as well, because we have so many issues. And if we're going to make it to the other end of all of these crises as a species, we're going to have to come up with innovative solutions. And part of that means we have a serious conversation about global capitalism and the way that it limits us from taking meaningful action. So uh, this is all talk that's like way too ambitious. I mean, if we get even incremental steps to ameliorate this disaster, that would be unexpected. But I mean, these are things that we have to talk about and think about because um, even when the pandemic is gone, its impact is going to be here for quite some time. Well, that's all that I've got for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far in the program, as usual, we're not going to close the show without thanking all of the people who make this episode uh, and show possible. Our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, thank you all so much. Well, that's it. I don't have anything left to say. Um, It's a relatively slow Newsweek, or I should say it's a comparatively slow news week, like looking back just a few months ago, like when I couldn't keep up with all of the news. Now it's starting to slow down. And I'm uh, I'm definitely thankful for that because I, I think that we're all feeling the election fatigue, myself in particular this week. Maybe I'm just like um, feeling a little bit more lazy and I, I'm a bit more of a procrastinator after getting a longer weekend with Thanksgiving and whatnot, even though I did fuck all for Thanksgiving. You know, I, I still took that time off to just like watch movies and play video games. And it was really, really nice. And now I don't want to, I don't want to talk about politics. It was nice to like cleanse my brain of the suffering that I inflict on myself by constantly thinking about politics. But <laughs> we're getting back to it like it or not. And you know, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a lighter week this week. So I'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been the Humanist Report. Have a nice weekend, folks.